Dr. Ghassami, I know it's been quite an eventful year for you, um, having recently been appointed as CIFAR AI Chair, recently awarded an NSERC Discovery Grant, and being awarded MIT's Tech Review's 35 Top Innovators Under 35. You've been recognized as one of the few innovators and technologists who have led a movement ensuring the health of machine learning models. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about that. Can you tell us a little bit about, on a high level, what healthy machine learning really is? Sure. I think for me, as a computer scientist, a lot of what we're trained to do is to build a model that's optimal for predicting some outcome, right? Where optimal means you're minimizing the loss in an error, mm -hmm. right? But when you look at a lot of the problems that we're dealing with in healthcare, optimality is very subjective, right? There is poor inter and intra rater agreement on a single patient's case. Mm -hmm. And so if you're uncertain about a label, then how can a model do best? And what is the definition of best in that case? Mm -hmm. And I think further, when we look at some of the power that machine learning algorithms have to, for example, in one of the talks here today by Jeff Dean of Google, look at an image of a retina and predict gender mm -hmm. with 95% accuracy. Mm -hmm. That's really uh, crazy and amazing. But if an algorithm can tell your gender from a scan of your eye, mm -hmm. and decision making in any way is related to gender for care, that might lead to poor knock-on effects. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of the healthy machine learning that I try to advocate for in the space of healthcare is being very aware, very embedded, very entrenched in both the technology that we're using in these models and also the possible second order effects of using said powerful models in the healthcare space. Can you give us a few examples of um, some knockoff or potential knockoff yeah. effects of, of using some of these data sets for these outcome-based right. initiatives? Uh, so we, we had a paper last year where uh, a graduate student uh, at MIT actually I was collaborating with showed that you can algorithmically model the mistrust in doctor and patient interactions. And so we showed that minority patients actually communicate differently with their doctors, mm. which lead to disproportionately more aggressive care in end-of-life decisions. Wow. And uh, these things have been known at an epidemiological level for a long time. Mm -hmm. So we know that humans are biased, and doctors are humans, and patients are humans, so mm -hmm. guess what? Healthcare is also biased. Mm -hmm. And while we have very high-level reporting that's demonstrated that more black women die in childbirth than white women, mm -hmm. when machine learning models are able to look at an individual patient record mm -hmm. and make predictions with that record, the danger is that they were operationalized biases mm -hmm. that are present in training data. Right. And so that's what we need to be aware of. We need to be aware that when we take millions of examples of images of chairs and mm -hmm. say, all humans agree that these are chairs. Let's just be really good at labeling chairs. Mm -hmm. There's no danger in deploying a chair model and, and being concerned about whether a chair gets misclassified and hurts the chair. Right. But if we look at healthcare, we have a very robust history, even very recently, of different groups being treated inappropriately, either maliciously or just unintentionally being uh, given less access to uh, care, mm -hmm. being given um, treatments that are not equivalent to other groups, mm -hmm. or just having unequal outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so recognizing that this is true, for example, in more aggressive end-of-life care, in maternal care given to women of different races, mm -hmm. is really important when we go to actually build a model and then deploy it to try to improve healthcare. Mm -hmm. Right. So essentially what I think one of the themes that you, what you talk about is in the front line whereby communication between provider and patient is often a function of um, you know, constrained resource allocation. There is a great, a disproportionately great opportunity for bias to, um, you know, at scale, have really profound effects in generating noisy and potentially um, harmful insights for, right. for particular underrepresented populations mm -hmm. specifically. 
So how do you predict the uh, next generation of, of tools, machine learning tools, and even patient-facing tools can address some of these data quality issues like data sparsity, right. the high dimensionality of this clinical data, and, and really systematic inaccuracies of, of the data sets for larger research, research initiatives? I think there is a lot of opportunity in machine learning to go beyond what we usually think of as clinical tools, right? Mm -hmm. So if you want to paint machine learning and artificial intelligence very broadly, then we're already using those in the clinic, right? Mm -hmm. You go into a hospital and you get a risk score, mm -hmm. right? There are septic shock risk scores, there are organ failure scores. So we've already made decisions previously based on observing large amounts of patient data that certain variables when they're in within uh, a specific range should be added together and then that's a risk score. Mm -hmm. So now we have this opportunity to take all of the data that we observe about a person when they enter the healthcare system and make more accurate predictions. And so I think data quality becomes very important because uh, so ideally we don't want to increase the, uh, the amount of data that's available about a particular person by sending them to the doctor more often. So what's important is that we're able to augment what we think of as traditionally medical data, so things that are present in the electronic healthcare record, with other kinds of data, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, if a person uses um, a mobile phone and consents to having their passive data used as a way of informing a risk score, as a way of communicating with their doctor about their daily habits, I think that kind of data can be really powerful. Because we don't currently have a robust understanding of what it means for a person to be healthy. Mm -hmm. We know what various states and levels of being unhealthy look like, but we don't really have this tight definition of this is what a healthy person looks like, mm -hmm. especially for a diverse set of people. And so given that lack of information, being able to acquire data from individuals when they're not heavily monitored in a clinical setting is incredibly valuable. Mm -hmm. And I think we have some of the methods to deal with this kind of data. So we have uh, you know, convolutional neural networks that operate very well on images because that's also how images are meant to be processed by a human brain, right? Mm -hmm. We use convolutions. We have recurrent neural networks that operate in the same way that people often generate text or language. Mm -hmm. You look at prior states and then inform the set of things you might say or write next. Right. We have graph convolutional neural networks, right? Those work really well on things that are naturally graphs like social networks where people interact. We need to create a new set of deep models mm -hmm. that work well for healthcare data, which is a mixture of these interactions in a healthcare setting, but also passive data that inform a person's state of health. Right. Now, if you look at the whole spectrum of data augmenters that are really patient-derived, what data sources are you personally, as a computer scientist, most excited about in using right. to kind of uh, in an adjunct way augment the quality of insights we can get from EHR data or other kind of traditional data yeah. assets? I think there are several spaces I'm very excited about. Um, all of them come with their own caveats, right? Mm -hmm. Just like we know the electronic healthcare record can be biased in terms of intra and inter-rater agreement, right? So two doctors can disagree about when diabetic onset happened for a particular person. I am very excited about working in the mental health and maternal health spaces. Mm -hmm. And in those spaces, a lot of self-report mm -hmm. matters a lot more mm -hmm. than what you would see in electronic healthcare records. So for example, if you have a major depressive disorder, it's probably more important that you search on your phone every day why am I so sad, mm -hmm. rather than at your once a month check-in, you tell your doctor, I've been feeling sad this month. Mm -hmm. If you are pregnant, it's probably more important that you search every day, why am I throwing up, rather than when you have your trimester check-in with a healthcare provider, you say, I have extreme emesis, right? right? And so being able to go from my experience, right, to some sort of uh, codified outcome that's been validated within a healthcare record, marrying this sort of self-reported data, which is my validation of my experience, passive data that I have consented to use in some sort of algorithm that correlates with my self-report, right? Because we know people are often poor uh, judges of their past behavior. So if we can correlate those two 
and then use the electronic healthcare record as this downstream validation of what's happened from a uh, professional point of view, I think that's really powerful. Mm -hmm. So being able to use people's self-reported uh, mood, people's self-reported experience, mm -hmm. correlate that with passive data about where they've been, how far they've walked, when they woke up, all of the information that you can get off of wearable devices or phones, I think is really powerful. And so one of the themes that you're kind of alluding to is this passive data collection as a kind of continual variable that can be input into a larger kind of learning model, which can be more robust than the traditional methods. And I think more robust uh, with all those caveats, right? right. So, you know, we machine learning uh, healthcare people sort of complain as is about the quality of data that you get from a healthcare record, mm -hmm. even though that is by comparison, very good, right? You have professionals who are often making sure that these records are as robust as possible for uh, quality purposes, liability purposes. Uh, mm -hmm. Often you have separate staff that is trained to code up billing data in particular ways. When we move into the wearable or the search or the self-reported space, all of those are off the table. Right? Mm -hmm. So suddenly you're dealing with vastly more continuous data, mm -hmm. but the quality of any individual point is mm. more suspect. Right. And so I think making those trade-offs is important both intellectually but also algorithmically when right. you're looking at a model to deal with the data. Right. So when we look at generating kind of a broader learning healthcare system and we speak about really taking a lot of these data sources for the purpose of feeding into a learning system, what do you think are current challenges, aside from the data quality issues that we talked about, that you think are great opportunities in the future? There, there are so many. There are so many challenges that are secret opportunities. Yes. Um, this space, you know, many PhD students have uh, many long careers. <laughs> I think one thing to keep in mind is when we talk about deploying any technology, a lot of the, the technical parts of the model pale in comparison to the importance of how you deploy something. Mm -hmm. So I have a collaboration with St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto, mm -hmm. and uh, I built a model. I have a PhD student who you know, can predict the need for an ICU bed from the general ward with very high accuracy. Mm -hmm. And so the hospital contacted us and said, we'd like to deploy this. We have a team. Let's make this happen. Mm -hmm. So we were talking to the doctor, and uh, I said, okay, what accuracy do you want? What sensitivity, what specificity, what positive predictive value? And he looked at me and said, I can look at two alerts per day. Mm -hmm. I don't care about any of those other numbers you can report. Mm -hmm. I can look at two. So you pick the right two. Right. And I think that change is very important. You know, mm -hmm. on the technical side, mm -hmm. I do want to make sure that my models are the most robust they can be in terms of accuracy, sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, sure. Mm -hmm. But understanding that the optimization extends to a human workflow mm -hmm. is, I think, very important for deployment. Right. And other things like, uh, you know, human workflow involves human factors. So if we're talking about two alerts per day, is it better if I give them to you on your phone? Do you want them on the screen? Should I give them to you using a visual? Do you want text? Do you want it to happen during a break? Should it be the first thing in the morning during rounds? Mm -hmm. All of those are variables that have to be tested and have nothing to do with the model, right? The right. model itself is could be at this point static and robust you know, to certain prediction tasks. Mm -hmm. We really just need to decide what makes the most sense within specific clinical workflows and that's going to vary dramatically from problem to problem and maybe from location to location. Mm -hmm. So what you really are talking about is I think something that we hear at Stanford um, in recent times is really empathetic design and designing a system that understands operational constraints that inform how we can use data and how we can develop technology. So thank you so much for sharing your really truly innovative and, and pioneering insights and for taking the time to share them with me. all of us. This thank has you. been fun. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks.